Appreciate everyone being here tonight. We are going to be in John chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. John chapter 10, verse 22. And I have to admit, uh, I'm very nervous tonight. Um, not because uh, of the uh, live streaming, although that is a little, a little, uh, uh, that, yeah, but that's uh, what it is. The people in my family are dropping like flies with the flu. Um, the Reeds had it last week. Marcy had it last night. My mom has had it. My neighbors have it. And you ever, it's like every time my stomach growls, I go, oh, no, no, no. And uh, I hear it's, I hear it only lasts 12 hours, but it's very violent. I'm no longer a violent person. I, uh, I just want to just have peace and ease the rest of my days. But uh, I'm really nervous, and it's like, oh, no. So if you've had the flu this week or think you're going to get the flu, I appreciate you. I don't need to shake your hand. And no, I love you, but I want to just stay away. I'm thinking about getting a hotel tonight or sleeping over at the barn with the, with the uh, animals, but they could have the flu. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, hopefully it'll be okay. So anyway, uh, John chapter 10 tonight, beginning with verse 22. Uh, as I said last week, this is beginning the time when Jesus uh, is in the temple during the Feast of the Dedication. And if you know anything about the Feast of the Dedication, you may not recognize it by that name, uh, but it's still a, a holiday or a, or a feast that is celebrated by Jewish people, and that is the feast known as Hanukkah. And uh, maybe you've heard that word, but this is that. And uh, it's basically a feast uh, that was started after the Maccabeans, uh, Judas Maccabees, took back over or reclaimed the, the temple after Syria uh, and the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes took it over in about A.D. 65, or not A.D. 65, I'm sorry, uh, 165 B.C., before Christ. And uh, be, as we get into the text... You might want to know a little bit of something about that because this, the, this whole section of John is between the Feast of the Tabernacles, that would be the, the Feast of the Fall Harvest, you know, a time of great celebration and feasting and eating and, and the, the Jewish people lived in tents or, or booths as uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. The tavern, and, and now it's the Feast of Dedication. And uh, this feast, again, is, is a celebration, but it, but it is more of a spiritual celebration than a physical celebration. And when you look at this in context as to how Jesus is presenting himself and how he's taking up, uh, you know, and confronting the, the religious leaders of the day, the Jewish leaders of the day, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but the Feast of Dedication uh, was, was a time of great ability to overcome. Because the king of Syria, the Syrians were wretched people. They were mean. You can read about the Syrians in, uh, outside of biblical literature and you can see they were just mean. They were spiteful. And they were just awful. When they went in and conquered a city and took over a city, it, it was plundered, and most of the people were killed. Uh, and, and not only just killed, but in very violent ways. Uh, it is said that uh, uh, Antiochus, uh, the king, when he went into uh, Jerusalem, he took over the temple, and he just utterly just took everything. They, he stole the, all the gold and the silver out of the treasury, and they said that that was worth millions. And he just plundered it. He, he stole it, uh, and uh, he turned the temple into a, a house of prostitution. 
Think about that. The temple, <coughs> once Solomon's temple, once, then Herod's temple, uh, the Syrians go in there and they take over Jerusalem and they go to the temple and they turn the dwelling place of God the, the, you know, the earthly representation of God and turn it into a house of prostitution. Now, how angry do you think God would be when that happened? And not only did, did they do that, but uh, I was reading in uh, uh, William Barclay. He's, a, he's not only a really good commentator, but he's a very good historian when it comes to uh, the Jewish religion. And Barclay said that, uh, actually, you might, whenever you hear the word and uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the sacrifices remember what he sacrificed in the temple yes he sacrificed it, uh, swine or pigs on the altar that's a no no I mean that that is just taking God's religion and just doing desecrating it and uh, he did that and not only did he do that but uh, if you were caught during the the three-year reign of the Syrians in Jerusalem, if you were caught with a copy or at least, you know, something that had to do with the law of Moses, you were executed that bad. So he wanted nothing to do. He didn't want anybody to have anything to do with, with any other religion than his own, which was none. Uh, he followed the Greek gods. Zeus, as a matter of fact, uh, he offered sacrifice on the altar in the temple to Zeus. Now, who's Zeus? Huh? A Greek god, but is he real? No, he's a mythical. We read, I remember in eighth grade we studied mythical religions, and we studied Zeus. And... Uh, you know, he, he really, he was a Greek god, Zeus, you know, he's claimed to be pretty much the, the equal with Jehovah God or the, the creator God, the all-powerful Zeus. And this guy went in and took the altar of Jehovah God, the true and only living God, and offered sacrifice to Zeus. And he also, I found this interesting, um... He banned circumcision. And if, you, if a mother was caught circumcising or uh, was caught with a circumcised Jewish boy, she would be crucified along with her child hanging on to her neck or, or something like that. Just, just awful. I mean, just things that, that uh, you know, the, the, these people were, were tragic. Today, they're still a nation. And we've got, have you heard anything about the Syrians in the news lately? Yeah. And uh, they're still, I mean, they're not like Antiochus Epiphanes, but they're a very small nation, but very hard to deal with because they're, they're just mean. That's all. They're just, just plain mean. And that's what was happening here. And during the Feast of Dedication is the feast that after the three-year reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, Julius, or, or Judas Maccabees, who was a Jew, again, this, is, this gets into extra-biblical literature, but during the time of the 400 years between uh, uh, the Testaments, Macca the Maccabeans went in and retook Jerusalem and reestablished the temple and temple worship. And thus, when they did that, they, they took all of the, you know, pollutions out of the temple and all of the desecration out of the temple and restored the temple again to back, you know, to what it should have been, where we get the idea of Hanukkah. And I, don't, I didn't read anything on this from Barclay, but I remember I had a sixth grade teacher. I don't know how I remember this. Sixth grade teacher, that was a lot of years ago. Um, but I had a sixth grade teacher who was Jewish. 
And about the time of Hanukkah, she brought the, you know, the menorah in and the candles and everything and taught us about, about the Jewish religion Hanukkah. And I remember her telling the story about the dedication or the rededication of the temple. And she said that, that uh, when the Maccabees went in there to, you know, to restore the, the worship of the temple, all of the oil that was that burned in the lamps in the temple had to be, you know, consecrated and had to meet all kinds of, you know, spe uh, specific uh, specifications under the law. And they found one jar or one little bag of oil that wasn't polluted, that met the standard one uh, cruise of oil, I think she called it, or one cruise of oil, and this, this, uh, they, they, they use it to light the lamp in the, in the temple, and that was only supposed to go for one day. There was enough for one day, but it went for eight days, and, you know, they claimed that was a miracle, and and, uh, you know, it, it lasted for eight days until the priest had enough time to make more oil. So that's kind of the background of Hanukkah. You remember every day for eight days they light, a, they light another candle? That's what that represents. And again, none of that, we don't read much of that in the Bible, but uh, we do see in this passage of Scripture tonight in verse 22, the Bible says, Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. And so here's where everything happened. And Jesus is there in Jerusalem during this feast. And then verse 22 says, And it was winter. Let me tell you something about this. Those Israelites over there know nothing about winter. This isn't the winter that you and I know about that we just are experiencing the last couple days. Uh, in Israel, winter's like, like Florida. I mean, it's, it's warm there. And once in a while in the high elevations, uh, once in a great while they'll get some snow. I think they got some snow in Tel Aviv last year for about 15 minutes. But... Uh, most commentators and most people think when, when this is translated winter, it, it, uh, it, the Greek word means a time of storm or, you know, a, a, a rainy kind of storm. So it was stormy out. Uh, and the, it wasn't like blizzard conditions and, you know, people sliding off the, the roads in their chariots and things. It wasn't like that, but it was stormy. And it's, it's interesting how John points that out. Again, I believe he's referring to the time of year uh, more than the weather report. Again, signifying the distinction between the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication. And the timing fits, all right? So, verse 22, and now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Verse 23 says, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, most of the time when we read about Jesus in the temple, he's doing something. What is it? He's teaching. Most of the time when you read about Jesus being in the temple, he's teaching. But he's not doing that this time. The Bible says that he's just walking. He's walking in Solomon's porch. And, and when uh, we, I was in, uh, we were in Jerusalem, we went to this place that had a, a uh, scaled-down version of Jerusalem during the time of Christ and the temple... And we got to see a, a, a model, a very outstanding model of what the temple looked like. And on the east side of the temple, of Herod's temple, there was like this colonnade. It looked like, uh, you know, like an like a outside uh, portico or deck. And it went all along the east side of uh, Herod's temple, and that was called Solomon's Porch. And it was, it was covered... But it was like a, a big, you know, columns and colonnades, and you could, you could walk through there, and you could get a lot of people in and out of there. And you remember, um, in, uh, 
is it First Peter? Is it, is it Acts three? I think it's Acts three. I think it's Acts three when Peter and John healed the the man lame, the the lame man in the temple. It was on Solomon's porch, and then also when when people would come and they would gather on Solomon's porch to hear, you know, to hear things about Jesus. I think that's in, in Acts chapter 5. Uh, and I could have those messed up. I don't, I don't remember. I didn't write those down when I was preparing for this. But Solomon's porch was a place where a lot of people could hear about Christ and, and discussions could be had and teaching could be done. But here, Jesus isn't teaching. He's walking. I don't know what he was walking about, but the Bible says that it was the Feast of Dedication, it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So this is exactly where he's at. This is what time it is, this is what the weather is, this is the time of year, this is precisely where he's at. What he's doing is walking, okay? You can't hardly misunderstand this. Verse 24. Verse 24, then the Jews... Notice the word they use there. The Jews surrounded him. Who were these Jews? What group of Jews? Were they just Jews? They were, huh? Well, they were, this Bible says, the Jews. These were the religious elite. These are the ones, here's exactly David, who have been following, antagonizing the Lord. These are, and they're referred to as the Jews, not the Jewish leaders, not the sect, not the Pharisees or the sect they are, the Jews. The Jews surrounded him and said to him, well, let, let's look at this idea. Put yourself in your mind's eye where Jesus is. He's on, he's in the, 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 the porch of Solomon and he's walking and of all, all of a sudden, the Jews, the religious elite, surround him. He's not teaching. So, you know, he doesn't have people gathered around him, but he's walking. Seems to me like this is an ambush. They may have been waiting for him, I don't know, but the Bible says they surrounded him. On all sides. So they weren't interested, I don't think, in a, in a uh, discussion here. I think they were interested in much more trying to get him to admit that he was the Messiah or the Christ. Because notice what, notice what the Bible says here. It says, when the Jews surrounded him and said unto him, How long do you keep us in doubt or suspense if you are the Christ Tell us plainly. Now, this is very interesting here as to how this terminology is set forth. Jesus, throughout the book of John, has already told them who he is. Countless times. Real quickly, let's look at some verses. Go back to John chapter 3, just so we can understand what's taking place here. Look at John chapter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> Jesus said, No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven, speaking directly of himself. He ascended, or he, he descended from heaven, and he is ascending to heaven. So again, signifying that he is deity or the Son of God. Verse 15, that whosoever believes in him, who? The Son of Man, Jesus, the Christ. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Again, Jesus is signifying and telling people what he's able to do and who he is from the, just these two verses. <coughs> Look at John chapter 5. Now again, as I was looking through here, there's a lot of passages of Scripture and verses that, you know, you can draw the conclusion that's who he's talking about, but these really draw your attention. It's, uh, John chapter 5, look at verse 39. 
you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are the and the, and these the scriptures are they which testify of who me and what do they do testify of eternal life and these scriptures testify of Jesus said me again notice the implication there look at chapter 7 and I'm just hitting some highlights here I'm sure there are more verses but these are just ones that'll that'll help us see chapter 7 verse 28 Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Verse 29. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. You can't hardly misunderstand what Jesus is talking about there, whether you want to believe it or not. Okay, look at chapter 8, verse 58. This, uh, this one got him. This one really made him mad. Chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, there's that term again, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, what? I am. Whoa. And then notice, then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus went out. So they knew what he meant there, didn't they? They knew exactly what he meant. And then uh, real quickly, look at chapter 9, verse 35. Chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast, that they had cast him out. And uh, again, this is about the, the, uh, the man that was healed. Uh, Jesus heard that they'd cast him out, and when he had found them, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, watch this, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Hmm. Pretty clear, isn't it? All right. One more. Chapter 10, verse 17. We looked at this last week. Jesus said, therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And here's the kicker. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. Again, signifying only deity can do that. Only deity has power over death. So, here in chapter 10, uh, verse 24, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus already told them numerous times who he was and why he was here and what he was about. So then why are these Jewish leaders wanting him to, to admit that he's the Christ or the Messiah. What if Jesus said, look, I'm sick of talking to you people. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. What would happen? Hmm? They would arrest him. Why? For blasphemy. For, because notice, if he's the Christ, he is the anointed one. And if he, if he claims in public that he is the Messiah, that means he's the king. He's the anticipated king of the Jews. What time do we live in right now? We're in Rome. Who's in authority? Rome. Who wouldn't take too kindly if somebody who is claiming to be the king of a nation that has been brought in, into, uh, you know, into servitude by the Romans? Well, they wouldn't like that. They'd put him to death very soon. Sooner than the Jews would, would have him put to death. So that's why, here, here no, notice this, this discussion here. Then the Jews surrounded him in Solomon's porch, in the temple, in public, in view of everybody, in the religious, the, the, most, the highest religious place 
of the Jewish religion. And they want him to say, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, notice that, if you are the Christos, the anointed one, the king, tell us plainly. Jesus isn't going to fall for that. He knew what would happen if he did that. So then, then verse 25. Jesus answered, said, I told you, and you do not believe. He did. He told him numerous times. Watch this, though. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. All of the miracles, all of the healings, all of the things that surrounded Jesus, all of the works demanded the acknowledgement that Jesus is not a common human being. No man can do these things except God be with him. No man can. All right? So, but, verse 26, you do not believe me, or you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Again, Jesus here is really getting down to the, to, the, to the nitty gritty and really just putting these Jewish leaders in their place. You remember not long ago, Jesus said, you are not shepherds. You're not qualified to be shepherds because you don't hear the Father. Now notice what he's saying. You're not even sheep because you don't listen. And he's, he's not talking to the Syrians there. He's talking to the Jewish elite, the leaders of God's religion of the day. He said, no, you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. And I said that to you. You're not my sheep. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Again, this is a, this is a beautiful illustration of what a faithful follower, or Christian, if you will, this is, this is how you can tell if you're a Christian. If you are a sheep in the sheepfold, if you're in the sheepfold, you're going to hear my voice, the, the, the voice of Christ. Today we hear the voice of Christ through his word, the Bible. Sanctify, him, sanctify them by thy word, thy word is truth. Okay? So the words of Christ are in and found in the New Testament, authorized by Christ, and uh, given to, to the apostles through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And if we're sheep, if we're in the sheepfold, Jesus said we're going to hear his voice. And when Jesus' voice differs from some other voice, if we are true sheep, whose voice are we going to hear? Duh. We're going to hear Christ's voice. You know, that's so easy to understand, but how come people don't do that? Because they're, like, they're just like these Jewish leaders. They don't have a heart to hear. They don't want to hear. They don't want to follow Jesus. They have their own idea of what religion should be, and that's how they want to do it. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. If you want to be known by Jesus, you're going to hear his voice, and not only hear it, notice what else. Hearing's not just enough. They follow me. It's not enough just to hear the voice of Christ. It's not enough to read the Bible, but you've got to do it too if you want to be in the sheepfold. If you want to hear, if you want Jesus to lead you and take care of you. Notice now what happens. Here's the sheep. The sheep hear his voice. They follow it. They, they follow his lead and notice the outcome or the circumstances that take place after the sheep follow him by hearing his voice. Verse 28. 
and I, notice Jesus said, I, I, not man, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Brethren, this verse right here ought to give us a lot of confidence as New Testament Christians. Because Jesus is saying, look, this is what you got to do if you want to be in my sheepfold. You got to hear my voice. You got you to follow me. And by doing that, I will recognize and I'll know you as one of my sheep. And if you're one of my sheep, I'm going to give you eternal life. Well, what do you mean by that? Notice how Jesus expresses this in this verse. Jesus says, I'm going to give you eternal life, and then it tells us how long that really is. You will never, never perish. Well, what do you mean by that? We all die. We all die all the time. That's physical. But you're never going to perish in your everlasting and eternal life that I'm going to give you. I'm going to forever take care of you. And you're never going to perish, no matter what happens. And not only that, no one, that means no one is ever going to be able to snatch you out of my hands. Because, the next verse says, because the Father has given you to me and you, no one can take anything out of the Father's hands. And as I was reading and studying that, I couldn't help... Mark Meadows sneaking in there. Remember that song? I don't know if anybody remembers the, the, uh, the, uh, the song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. It's exactly where, this has to be, where that song has to come from because it's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Notice verse 29. My Father, who has given them to me, that's the sheep, is greater than all. I wish you could see the force of the word all in the original language here. It means, it means, well, it means all. <laughs> That's what it means. My father is greater than all. Greater than Satan? Uh-huh. Greater than political powers? Yes. Greater than governments? Yes. Greater than the meanest people in the world? Yes. My Father is greater than all. Watch this. And no one, that means no one, no person, no entity, nobody is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So we have, brethren, notice this, we have double protection. We not only have the Son's protection, promises us that through him, by being his sheep, that we're going to have eternal life, that we're never going to perish. No one's going to be able to snatch us out of his hand. And not only that, we've got double protection because God, who is above even Jesus, we can't, no one can snatch us out of his hand either. How good is that? How protected is that? How nervous should we be when we come into contact with evil. Only physical. It's only physical. And physical only lasts for a minute. They can take our lives, but they can't take our souls. They can't take eternity. Look at this. All right. <clears throat> the benefits of being in the sheepfold. Eternal life. Never perish. No one can alter their state. Once you are in the sheepfold, once you're in the Lord's church where salvation is, no one can snatch you out. Well, you can quit by refusing to hear and follow the Savior, but no one can snatch you out. No one. And that's very comforting. Very comforting for these people because they were being persecuted physically for their faith. 
and martyred and put to death and, and going through way more things than, than we go through. Verse 30. Oh, look at this one. I'm not going to have time to get into this one. We're going to talk about this next week. But these few little words, friends and brethren, are so powerful when it comes to Christianity. Notice what Jesus says in verse 30. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. Let me tell you what this doesn't teach. This doesn't teach the doctrine that is prevalent, Jesus only doctrine. Anybody ever heard of that? I know Bass have and a few of you have. Did you know at one time there was, there was a couple people here that believed in the Jesus only doctrine? And they were in one of my classes out back. And uh, that guy's no longer with us. He's passed away, and I can't hardly remember his name. But he would not give up on the Jesus only doctrine. What is that, Bass? What is the Jesus only doctrine? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. There's no, there's no Godhead. It's, it's Jesus is God just in a different form. Well, and the verse that that, that fellow showed me to, to, to prove his point is, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. We don't really have time. I want to get into this a little deeper. But... How many people, or how many persons, or personalities, are set forth in these few words? Who? Who are they? I and the Father are one. Very interesting that the, that the, word, that the word one... It's in the neuter gen, gen, gender. Meaning what? What's a, what's a masculine gender? Male. Father. Masculine gender. What's a feminine gender? She. Her. Okay? We, know, we understand that. What's neuter, what's neuter gen, gender? It's a thing or an it. It's not a he or a she. It's an it. All right? Watch. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. It. Thing. Not person. Doesn't, it, does, it can't mean person. If it meant person, then, then it's translated wrong. It can't. So it's an it. Next week, we're going to start talking about the Godhead and what Jesus meant by this. Because it's very important that we understand the Godhead in order to understand the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which I know most of you do, but maybe we can uh, shed some light on this next week. Okay, appreciate uh, you didn't nobody commented. Bass did because I asked him, but uh, appreciate your good attention tonight. Next week we'll pick up here.